Um, so I ended up going into neuroscience. I was in the graduate program in Princeton where um, I started to study um, object recognition, how we, how we recognize high level mechanisms for, for recognizing objects. And, um, and then I kind of drifted into the field of, of how we pay attention to objects. And um, that's got me into the research I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so um, I'll, you know, we'll, I'll present some material, some background kind of material, some of my own research. Uh, but this should be interactive, so feel free to jump in and question or anything you want. OK, so when, um, when I yell at my kids to pay attention, uh, I usually just mean wake up uh, and um, um, be alert. Um, but the kind of attention that uh, I'm going to talk about today is, um, is what we refer to as selective attention. So say you have a student in the class, and she's uh, trying to pay attention to the reading material in front of her. And, and she has some way of basically blocking out all the distractions around her um, and, um, and then and really just processing the, you know, the, the task at hand. And that's the kind of attention that I've been trying to understand and we're going to talk about today. And um, besides, you'll, as you'll see, there's, there's a computational aspect to this process. Um, but there's also just a phenomenological an awareness part of this process. And, and the, the effects of attention on just plain conscious awareness are profound. And you can't really give a talk on selective attention without some demonstrations of the power of attention, which is going every by the time I finish these demonstrations, you are all going to switch. You're all going to want to study attention. Now, here's so the uh, the first demonstration. Uh, if you haven't seen some of these are old, but um, if you're coming from all these different backgrounds, maybe you haven't seen these before. Um, it's just a complex scene that's going to be flashing on and off. Yes. But that was physically darker. I, that was not just your attentional system darkening out all that distraction. I'm going to show you how, when there's no, when the physical stimulus is there, full blown, your internal state can essentially darken the distraction. But it's all inside your head. Okay, so be prepared. Okay, so I'm going to come and see if you get this. Um, so there's a complex scene flashing on and off, and I just want you to uh, mentally note when you notice something changing in the scene from flash to flash, OK? So you have that one? What's your name? Ariel. Say again. Ariel. Ariel. You, you have, have it? it? Uh, Anybody else have it? You have it? Someone? A couple people? OK, good. Well, OK, I'm going to give you a hint. The airplane engine. It's appearing and, and disappearing. You see that now? Yeah, I hope none of you are pilots. Um, so, uh, so think about it. So your eyes, uh, you know, this is, this inf all this information is going into your eye, right? And probably if I was, you know, I, I had uh, electrodes around your eyes when monitoring where you're looking, your eye probably passed right over the airplane engine, right? And so it wasn't like your retina didn't get this information, but somewhere between the retina and the soul, the airplane engine got filtered out, and because you weren't specifically paying attention to it. Now, you thought you were attending to the whole scene, right? You thought you were aware. Just like right now, you think you're aware of everything, right? But if I was to test you about um, you know, the, the color of the floor or, you know, the, fee, the feel of your seat and so on. Until I asked you to pay attention to it, it's not getting processed, right? And so it's really an illusion that we have access to all the information coming into our sensory system at all the time. It's a pretty good illusion. Yeah, were you? Oh, you're just yawning. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll give you another. So you think there's something funny with flashing scenes. So I'm going to give you another demonstration. This is called a mud flash. Um, so what you have here is you have these, these blocks flashing on and off. And just did you notice something that's changing in this scene? Some of you have caught that. OK, that's good. Do you see the lines? Yeah. 
It took, it took a little while, though. It's, it's, in Boston, people never get this. We have the worst drivers. They don't notice, they don't notice anything. OK, so all right. And the reason that um, you know, we had the flashing scenes or the mud flashes and so on is because um, what they do is they mask the temporal change. So if I all of a sudden you know, make a big temporal change, you know, like a pound the table or something, that will orient your attention to that change. So the temporal changes um, keep you from paying attention to the one thing that is changing. And so it's just an attentional manipulation. So I'm going to give you one more uh, demonstration. And this comes from Ode Oliva here at MIT. And this one, there's no flashes. I feel like I'm doing a magic show here. There's no flashes. I have nothing, nothing up. I have either sleeve, nothing. Um, but, uh, but there's going to be a gradual change, OK? So there won't be the sharp temporal transient. And so just see if you can notice the um, a gradual change. You all saw something? OK, that's good. Did you notice all of these changes? <laughs> Major parts of the building, people appeared and disappeared from the streets, the signs. You want to do it again? All right, OK, all right, I'll give you a, I'll give you, give you a chance. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so this is your test to see if I was actually just making the whole thing up. <laughs> OK. So um, all right. So are you all convinced? How many of you are now switching, and you're now all going to study the neural basis of attention? <laughs> There we go. Converts. Yeah. So in all those pictures that you showed us, there's like one particular thing that's like really like the center of the picture, like the car here. Do you do that on purpose to kind of distract us even more? Or is that like... Yeah, there's an art you know to making these uh, demonstrations. So yeah, so let's say if it was the car just disappeared in the middle, OK? Or changed from you know this little white car to a giant limousine. Yeah, you're, you're going to get that. But, but, the, but the thing is, though, that um, the things that are changing, it's not like some little pixels someplace, right? They're pretty major things. Um, and, um, and so it's just to show you that they're major enough that you would have thought you would have processed them, right, at some point. I mean, because people are looking at this for like a minute. And so, um, so that's really the key thing here. It's not that you don't process anything. It's that you don't process everything is the point. Yeah. Before you were like joking that no one is a pilot, a pilot in the, the airplane image, and then maybe Boston drivers are bad, so we didn't notice the lines. But does it actually take apart in attention the things that you care about? And because at first I thought maybe oh, I maybe it's because I really don't pay attention to these things that I think got passed by me. But now I see a whole person appeared or disappeared, and I didn't pay attention to that. So I'm wondering like how does that? Uh, okay, that's an excellent point. And um, actually, I, probably it was a little unfair asking you about the, pi the pilot, because um, I think in, when people learn to be experts at things, a lot of it actually is learning how to pay attention to the right things. So things, you see, you know, the average person sees something, and they don't know that they should pay attention to the airplane engine or the gas tank or all these sorts of things. And the training consists of pay attention to this, pay attention to that, and so on. Um, even so. Uh, even though we all have driving instruction, we all still fail to pay attention to things that we should have and, and crash into things and all kinds of problems, right? Yeah? So that we don't pay attention to everything? Because if not, wouldn't it be like sensory overload? Exactly. So we are going to get to why we don't pay attention to everything. And we're going to, well, exactly, we'll get to that. Yeah? Like be our past experiences, or like even on a better level of evolution. If I imagine myself standing on a street, the car is more important to my um, to me being able to safely you know cross the street than let's say a sign above this um, above that building. So that could, could that be also. So you're saying that through uh, natural 
selection, the people who don't pay attention to poor, poor, important things get filtered out of our population <laughs> <laughs> and don't have children and pass on those bad genes that... You know, we <laughs> to the right um, object and the correct situation might be an evolutionary benefit. Okay, that's an, also an excellent point, and I'm sh absolutely sure that is um, shaping our attentional system. But an argument has also sometimes been made that um, in any population, it's good to have some people who are scanning their attention around and not just focused on the same thing that you think anybody should be focused on. And they'll be the ones maybe that catch the tiger in the bushes that nobody else is paying attention to, or the, some other thing that you know, every, the, whole, you know, the whole community should have noticed but didn't because they're so narrow focused. So you know, and it could be that our population encourages a variety of different attentional strategies um, that helps the whole community, it may or may not help that individual person so much. Yeah. Well, this is a chance to yeah. Um, what, like, how does the brain itself know what to filter out versus what to pay attention to in any particular moment of time? So, OK, also an excellent question. And let me give you a, a, a sort of a simple-minded answer. But uh, I mean, it, it's got to be true in some ways, is we pay attention to the things that are behaviorally important. So the things, so when you, when you walk into a room, you don't uh, say, you, you don't pay attention to the corner of the, the, the screen. You don't pay attention to the handrail over there and so on. So you have learned, again, it's like the expert thing, but you have learned through living what kinds of things should you be paying attention to, like the general layout, how you can walk, where the aisles are, where the seats are, and so on and so on. So um, there's a learning aspect to um, you know, what we have, what we do pay attention to in a given, in a given kind of situation. Yeah. What about a scenario, in, for example, if I was supposed to be um, having a conversation with her and someone else is talking in the background, I can focus on what we're talking about and filter out what's in the background. However, if we're at the subway, for example, and I'm having a conversation with her, as soon as the train comes, my attention is diverted. Like, how does ah. the brain itself like filter out the background? Right. Um, I'm trying to think if I have the... Um, the slide of the cocktail party phenomenon here. Uh, no, I don't have the cocktail party phenomenon. Okay, but um, what you're describing are elements of what uh, some people have referred to as the cocktail party phenomenon. So you're in, and, you know, and this is like a classic example in psychology. I use it in my class all the time. Um, about what happens in a cocktail party. And after, t after a while, though, I began to worry that actually no one knows anymore what a cocktail party is. <laughs> have, you, have, have any of you actually been to a cocktail party? You have? Really? I haven't been to a cocktail party in years. But in any case, in a cocktail party, so the idea is you're standing around a group of people, and um, there's all kinds of conversations going on around you, right? And so can you, is it possible to pay attention to all of them at the same time? No, you can't, you can't follow them. But if there's one person you would be like to be talking to, you could zero in right on them. Um, and so what that means is that we don't have the capacity to process all the information around us at the same time. However, the flip side of the coin is we, have the, we do have the capacity to s zero in on one source of information. So we can't do everything, but we have this ability to zero in on a source. Um, and then you brought up the point about you know, the subway arise. Well, there's two aspects of that. So, and partly it could be a, a learning aspect um, because the sound of the subway has become important. Just like, and this is another classic cocktail party phenomenon, you're talking to somebody in front of you, you're all engaged in the conversation, and then across the room somebody mentions your name. Okay? And so, boom, you immediately are, oh, who, who just said my name? And so if you think about that, that's a little bit mysterious, right? Because Suppose like, so your brain's got a filter. It's going to filter out this information. If the filter were in the retina, then, or in your cochlea, how could you process, how would you know that someone said your name across the room? So the filtering has to be high enough into the system that it can still process things like names and so on, but maybe at a lower level of intensity. And then, but something like your name can break through, or the subway sound breaks through. There's one other aspect to it, though, which is, um, you know, just as I, you know, if I say, pay attention here, I go that, right? So you all.
paid attention to that. And so because the sense, the strength of the sensory sig the stimulus itself can uh, your attention. And so really what we're, your attentional system is doing is sort of, of, of sort of downplaying some sources of information and highlighting others, but it doesn't completely block out and is still sensitive to um, lots of things in the sensory environment. Yeah. Oh. This is like the same thing, but um, sometimes when, like, when I'm first learning something, I pay attention to like literally everything. But after I get like really good, I kind of like block stuff out. And like, for example, like when I was first learning soccer, I had to like really pay attention to what my feet is moving. But now when I play, I don't even pay attention to like I pay attention to like what's ah, around me. Okay. Things. Right. But another thing is that when I drive, sometimes I just like blank out and drive for 15 minutes. <laughs> 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 just, like, the right so I don't know. So that's like the same thing. Yeah, so uh, you're bringing up another really important point, which um, it, it's, a, it's partly an attentional issue and partly what we call an executive control issue. And that when you first are learning something, it takes a lot of what we call executive function, a lot of prefrontal function, that you have to sort of consciously be aware of all the things that you're doing, all the steps, and so on. And that um, this is, it's, it's um, very well known, particularly with a lot of motor skills, that as you practice them more and more, you don't need your prefrontal cortex anymore. You don't need to consciously process all those different steps. So think about first time you try to, try to ride a bicycle. You're like concentrating on every little aspect to keep it going off. But after you've, you ride a bicycle for a while, you don't have to think about all those things, right? And so they, they're parts of your brain can take over some of those operations that don't require this kind of executive function and attentional control and so on. Yeah. This been or, so our generations that are born basically with smartphones and tablets in their hands. Um, how has that impacted um, these processes? So also, I get asked this question a lot, um, and um, there are lots. People have you know debates on different sides of this. Are all the you know the things like the smartphone, the computer games, and all these things going on? Are they a good thing or a bad thing? And um, and I know the answer. <laughs> uh, the, the answer is, just like almost everything else that we do, is that a, to a certain degree, things can be good. But if they are excessive, and I choose like drinking or you know, so many different things, if it's excessive, it can be a big problem. So, um, and, and, there's, and there's certainly has been research on, let's say, kids who play a lot of computer games or something, and actually, um, there's as much research showing that that can actually cause benefits to kids as there is research showing that it could cause problems for kids. So the answer is somewhere in between, unfortunately. So I had some questions up here. Yeah. Um, yeah. My question was if you've ever done work on um, or know some work on um, how you what changes from person to person on their interaction of tendency, how is how um, to determine their level of distraction is, like how they... When they're like, what's the genetic <coughs> basis to how people pay attention? Yeah, you know something about that. Um, and well, I okay, know. that's an, another in, really interesting uh, topic. So, um, give me an example of, um, of ADHD. So, attention deficit disorder. Very, very common. Um, and uh, you, we used to think about a lot of disorders as categorical. It's, it's like, like, you, like, like um, tuberculosis. You either have it or you don't. You know, typhoid. You either have it or you don't. And um, what, what, uh, what's, people are beginning to um, understand about a lot of, of um, disorders that involve the brain is that a lot of these things are continuing distributed in the population. So there's a continuous distribution of how focused people can be, how much they're willing to sit quietly in a classroom, all kinds of things that um, we, we put under the label of attention. And that there's a genetic basis for the whole spectrum. So even if so you say, well, what's the genetic basis of ADHD? Put aside ADHD and just say, take some testing battery that tests people's ability to attend or, 
do executive function, a lot of different things. And then ask, is it more similar in monozygotic twins, identical twins, or in, in fraternal twins, zygotic twins? It's always going to be more similar in monozygotic twins. You can calculate the genetic contribution, and it's high for the whole spectrum. So yeah, there's, um, there's a strong genetic basis, but obviously, just like you know, for the genetic basis of almost everything, you're usually the, the genetic explanation is on the order of you know, maybe 60% or so, and that means there's going to be a lot of variability coming from the environment uh, as well. Yeah. Is attention something that you can sort of train to improve, or is it something that is fixed? Uh, also, a really good question. Um, and I, it's given you know, our discussion about some of the other um, um, aspects of learning and attention. Um, you can learn to pay attention to certain things. So you learn to pay attention to airplane engines, or your pilot, and so on. Uh, the question is, though, can you train your ability to attend and focus in general? And uh, it's very close to the question of, can you train people to have better executive function? A lot, lots of things will be lumped into executive function. Be tasked, being able to stay um, on task, being able to switch efficiently, and so on. Um, and uh, I'd say the jury is really out on that. Um, there's the, and that's, a, that's a, the, the hottest area in childhood education right now is, well, can you train kids to have better executive function, better attention, and so on? And um, there's evidence both for and against that. But th that's something that I would think for society, We'd ha it would really benefit us to have a better understanding of what it is you can actually train people to do that's better. All the debates in the newspapers and so on about whether cognitive training in adults uh, you know, is helpful. And does it protect you from Alzheimer's disease? And, and, and a lot of those are attentional kinds of tasks. And you know, this, that's a big debate too. Yeah. Isn't it controversial like, that we only pay attention to behavioral beneficial things since like for human species? On society is much more complicated. It's not just focused right now on, on surviving. We're like we're not like primates, which primates which are, which are only like interests are getting food or procreation or whatever. Since like us humans come, uh, society is just simply more complex. There's more, I would say, relevant things to to uh, survival that we need to pay attention yeah, to. Just things to be, that humans should be paying attention to are in general different than what monkeys should be paying attention to, but that doesn't mean that the, the basic brain mechanisms are that different. It's just there's different things are important for monkeys. Uh, so, so to, I mean, you may think, human being, your attentional abilities are so much better than a monkey's, but if you go into a monkey's environment, that monkey may, you know, really just ace it, you know, the problems of finding the right fruit and finding the right tree to jump on something. You don't know how to pay attention in that environment. Like certain like mental um, illnesses that that I would think that at least like people for paying attention to certain things that are not relevant to the other mass of, of population that might like lead a little bit more to a theater, theoretical basis of what it is. So you're saying so humans because of human culture there may be a higher prevalence of attentional disorders um, because of the requirement and yeah I, that could be that that um, let's say among animals. Um, that um, um, it's, uh, you know, the demands in their life is such that even if they don't have the ability to attend to things for more than a second, like a dog, um, then uh, it doesn't cause such a big problem for them. But if a human were like that, then it's be more problematic just be giving human society. That, you know, there's something to that. But probably all animals have this ability to select between things that are important and not important. And let me give you an example. If you, um, you take a frog and there's two flies fly in front of the frog, the frog doesn't jump at the average fly. The frog jumps at one of the flies. Okay? And so that means it's selected which one to go for. And that's, that's, many people think that that process of selecting the fly is very mechanisms maybe have a lot of similarities to our selecting to pay attention you know, to the engine versus you know, something else. It's a choice. There's just some decision making involved. There's learning involved. There's heredity involved. All kinds of things. But it's a lot of similarity. Who, has, who haven't I called on before? Yeah, you. Um, I believe you mentioned that behavior also um, influences attention. Is that correct? 
Behavior in terms of attention? attention? Pay attention. So what do you mean by behavior? Like, per se, um, I was going to ask, like, does personality have an influence on how we pay attention? Ah, so what's the relationship between personality and attention? Are different personalities... Um, you mentioned that you know people pay attention to certain to certain things that they find an interest in. So I kind of make that correlation with personality wise. So I th say I think you maybe think about it in personality is like really individual differences that each you know. So you know when psychologists talk about personality, they think about like the five major personality dimensions: introversion, extroversion, uh, openness, closed, you know, and so on, so on, and so on. But you're really talking about each person is just different. Right, and so, and each person brings to their life all kinds of biases and learned things and intrinsic things and so on. And yeah, so that's those are all going to have first order effects on um, how, you know what people pay attention to and how they pay attention. Absolutely. See so in the back, yeah. So you mentioned that we're constantly being bombarded by stimuli. And we, and we separate the relevant information with the irrelevant information by selectively attending. So the research done with autism, with children with autism, is it really um, individualized every particular area? Because as you just said, um, let's say my, the relevant information is probably not relevant for another person, so I may notice something that another person may miss. So how is that um, implemented, implemented with autism? So, yeah, that's a, also, the, you know, the role of uh, attention in autism, and that's another really important and interesting question. A lot of people are studying exactly that, um, because um, some people see autism as a social attention issue. That, um, that and, you know, this is related to, like, the, a lot of the questions you've been asking about, you know, are we, do we have an intrinsic or biological biases to attend to certain kinds of things, um, and, 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 one of those biases is to attend to social things. We tend to we attend to other people. We attend to their faces. We attend to where their eyes are looking, and so kinds and so on. And and autism, it looks as though for the social things, there's less attention being paid um, to social things, but there may be more attention paid to all kinds of other things. And so some of um, you know something somebody. Um, with a diagnosis of autism, may att pay attention to you know mechanical things and parts and all kinds of things that other people just ignore. And so yeah, there's um, you know again, it's like a spectrum of um, you know of what people pay attention to, and um, it's it's not black or white. It's not you know either you do this or you do that. But there's going to be a spectrum and a lot of variability across that that spectrum. Yeah, I'm interested. Asking about this relationship, and I think it's related to all the sessions between what I see as like two forms of a, different types of attention, like maybe like a higher cortical type of attention where it's like a top bottom thing, that's more like conscious, and then like conscious, and then you have like this other type of attention that's like just taking in stimulus and it's just like going from like bottom up. Mm -hmm. So, what's like the dynamic between these two? And like an example of that, that I always think of is when you ask people their name and you completely ignore their name after they say it. Is it because it maybe you're like consciously thinking it's more of a social thing? Like, oh, I'm just asking their name because it's the nice thing to do. You know, you're more thinking of the interaction rather than the actual answer to the question. So what's like that battle between those I mean, two? I think you put your finger on a, a basic distinction that psychologists make between bottom-up and top-down attention. And an example of top-down attention would be, let's say, if I pay attention to my left hand. OK, can you all do that? Yeah, you can do that. Because you, you decoded my verbal instruction, the social situation into account, and you forced yourself to attend to my left hand. There's nothing more interesting about my left hand, right? But if I you know, pound my left hand on the table, it's going to automatically orient. And that would be considered bottom-up. My asking you to attend to something would be considered top-down. And they very likely have very different mechanism. We think about top-down attention involving systems, which I may get a chance to talk about, um, but the bottom-up um, is uh, maybe more parietal systems and, and so on. We'll, we'll get to that. Let's see. Was, we went to a couple more questions. We should probably talk a little bit about the actual research. Yeah. So I'm really curious about like, how meditation and the effect that it can have on selective attention. Another really interesting topic. I mean, I don't work on that uh, myself, but um, 
there's a, quite a bit of work uh, on how attention can, now this is related to the question, can you train yourself to pay better attention? But there's, there's certainly some work that's suggestive that, um, that the process of meditation training um, gives people an enhanced ability to focus in on things. Um, and, um, and there's some brain imaging evidence and, and behavioral evidence and so on. Um, yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting issue as, the, as meditation as a novel strategy for, for getting people to pay better attention. Okay, is there some burning question or should we talk about a little bit about, brain? yeah, you have a burning question. Is it a machine that works to analyze all this stuff? Where does it store all this, all this sensor, sensory information that we have? Like, where is it stored? I mean, we can attention to certain things, but we see all of it, right? Do we memorize all of it? Is it going somewhere? Is it here? Ah. Um, okay, uh, also a good question. So, if we're not paying attention to something, so we're not fully processing it, maybe it's still getting stored, like on the hard drive someplace. And, um, and might, if we had some way of accessing it, we would get it, right? So you didn't pay any attention to the airplane a, a, a engine, but afterwards, you know, through some technique, I might be able to get you to retrieve it from memory. And the evidence is pr pretty much not. So if you didn't pay attention to it originally, it probably doesn't even get encoded. In There's quite a bit of evidence that, um, that what the, the, the attention that we pay at the, at the time of what psychologists would say is encoding getting the information stored in memory, that that process is incredibly important for what gets put into memory. And if you didn't, weren't paying attention to something originally, it probably doesn't get in memory. It's not available later. Like, there's an example that's kind of like opposite of that. Like, the person's walking down the street. He goes home and somebody asks him, do you have a nail? And he nails it to the mouth. He doesn't have a nail, and then he remembers all of a sudden, oh, wait, I saw a nail on the street. He wasn't looking at the street. He wasn't paying attention. But well, that would be pretty unusual that somebody remembers a, a, um, a minor detail that they weren't paying attention to and is able to retrieve it later. In general, I mean, I don't want to dispute that it didn't happen once with somebody with a nail, but all I'm just saying is, in general, the research is showing that the things that you attend to are the things that are much more likely to be stored in memory. All right. Okay. No. Now, um, oh, I did have a cocktail party in there. So I just want to say, so there's, there, um, there's, uh, you didn't really um, directly ask the question of the relationship between attention and eye movements. Um, if you look at people's eye movements, so you scan their eye, you know, you're, you're monitoring their, where they look, and you, you know, you, then you show them complex scenes, uh, it's clear that they don't, fixate random things. So there's not like some old CRT display where they're like going pixel by pixel. Zun, zun, zun. No, they go from the eyes to the person, so on. And so, so the, what is the relationship between attention and eye movements and fixation? And so one thing you could ask is, um, if you are paying attention to the thing that you fixate, uh, then how do you, if you're, let's say you're fixating on um, uh, here, how do you know to move your eye there if you were not paying any attention to it, right? So um, one, way, one way that people have a thinking about this is that actually your attentional system is quicker than your eye movements. And so what you do is you shift your attention around, find a target for your next eye movement, and then the eye follows it. So your attention is like jumping ahead of your eye movements and then the eye movement follows. And that you can, and in fact in the experiments that we do in my lab, um, we, you can uh, train animals and ask people to fixate one thing but pay attention to something else. And so you take, try to take eye movements out of the equation and just, have, just, and just have them manipulate their attention. And people have this ability and animals have this ability, um, but normally they're linked. Yeah. So how are you recording this if it's not through your eyes? Is it obvious? So how are we recording it? You mean? Yeah. How, how, how does the experimenter know this? How, how do you get into something else? Oh, so you're only saying, how does your brain do this? Good question. I've spent the last 20 years trying to understand that. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that.
All right, cocktail party phenomenon. We covered that. So um, a psychologist, uh, John Duncan and I, some years ago, came up with this general like framework for thinking about attention, which we call bias competition, which is that you can't process everything in the scene. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and if you try to, and I'm going to give, show you an example in an experiment of this, that your object recognition would be degraded if you tried to process everything at once. And so all these objects in the scene are competing for processing. And, and, the, and the processing can be biased in favor of one object or another based on um, both top-down behavioral relevance uh, as well as uh, bottom-up sensory information and that, um, and that you're shifting the bias in this competitive um, interactions. Um, and, then, and then as a result, visual recognition should be improved. And um, yeah, sorry, I think I have some... Uh, OK, so how does this come about? Um, so have you, have you had any lectures on the visual system? Yeah. Yes? Not here. OK. Well, just this is the, um, the one slide introduction to the visual system of primates. So um, the visual information uh, goes from the retina up through the thalamus and goes to the primary, first to the primary visual cortex uh, here in the back of the brain. And then it gets relayed. Uh, along a pathway into the uh, for object recognition gets relayed in, on a pathway into the temporal lobe, uh, and um, there's also gets relayed up into these parietal and prefrontal systems that we'll talk about that interact with the object recognition pathway, and in the object recognition path uh, at the primary visual cortex you have um, what are known as receptive fields. Or you know, this is the area in space where you'd have to have a stimulus to activate a given cell in your cortex. So in your retina, the receptive field is just going to be where the receptor is located on the, on the, on the, on the um, receptor surface, the retina. So you know, light in a given point in space will activate you know, one little spot on the retina. Well, the same thing is true up in the cortex. You have to have the stimulus only in a part of space will activate a cell in the cortex because there's a map of the retina in the cortex. And in the primary visual cortex, those receptive fields are very, very small. They're like the pixels in the scene. And similarly, uh, the, the cells are responding to sim very simple things like lines and edges and contours and so on, the, the elements of, of perception. But as you go along this pathway, processing becomes more and more complex. And, uh, and then by the time you get to the temporal cortex, you can even have cells that respond to, say, very high complex objects like faces, for example. And, and so in here, in the primary visual cortex, it may just be a, you know, an oriented line. But in the, the, in, the, in, the, in the temporal cortex, you may have you know, a cell responding to, that's Al Pacino. Um, and so uh, to something very, very complicated. And, and um, the, um, oh, I didn't have an example of the receptive fields. But also, the receptive fields are also getting larger along the pathway. So they're tiny pixel-like things back in the primary visual cortex. But, but in the IT cortex, it could be the entire visual field. And we'll come, come back to that uh, a little later. OK, so what happens when you record from neurons in the primary visual, in the, sorry, along this pathway, and you have animals pay attention to things or ignore things? And this is an example of a kind of experiment you could do. And it's a little bit complicated, so I'll just walk you through this. So let's say um, you're recording from. Um, way along this pathway in the monkey cortex. Uh, and the monkey is fixating this spot. Um, but you are, through training, you can instruct the animal to pay attention to one thing or another. It's like when I hold on my hands, pay attention to my right hand or my left hand. And you can do that. And so essentially, uh, you could train the monkey that when they get various cues and so on, they should pay attention to one thing versus another. And you can have the receptive field of the cell. So this is the area in space where the cell would respond to stimuli in the visual field. And so you place one stimulus in the receptive field of the cell you're recording from and another one outside. And then, by instruction, you can have the animal attend, say, the one outside the field or the one inside the field. And if you look at the response to the stimulus inside the receptive field, like right here, um, that you can measure in a firing rate histogram. So the cell is going, and then the, the, um, and you're just measuring the action potentials per second rate over time. And this is the response to the stimulus. And one thing you can find is 
that um, if you, it's the same stimulus in the two conditions, but if you've asked the monkey to pay attention to that stimulus, then the actual firing rate of the cell might be higher than, um, than if the animal's paying attention to something else. So it's like the gain of the sensory information is going up and down, depending on what the animal's attending to. And, uh, and the stimulus comes on here at time zero, but you can notice that even before the stimulus comes on, the cell's like, firing away a little bit higher. If the animal's been told to attend to one location, but the stimulus hasn't come on yet, so as though your visual system is primed. Now, oh yeah, something important is going to happen at this location. I'm going to be prepared to process that in a more efficient way. So your cells are, are primed to respond more when the stimulus occurs, in this case, uh, there. Does that make sense? Yeah. The peak uh, height is uh, established by the amount of neurons firing at the same time? No, like this is one neuron. This is a single neuron, and its firing rate is going up and down depending on where we've told the animal to attend. And you can find this throughout the whole processing pathway. That in general, if you have a single stimulus in the receptive field, so there's no competition within the receptive field, the firing rates will, will tend to go up. In one of the lectures we were told that usually when you record from neurons, you record from an, like an area because the, they're so tiny that you have to like, the breathing so much. Well, so some people do recordings from groups of neurons, same thing, whether it's a group or whether it's one. The individual neurons and the group will all have a higher firing rate. If I understood, uh, you said that she was primed or it like was prepared. prepared because the instruction came back here. Pay attention to, to say this location before, it had the before the stimulus was on. Okay, so it was basically looking at nothing, and it was like prepared to That's see right. something pop up. That's right. It's like, I suppose this screen was blank, and I told you, pay attention to the screen because in a couple seconds, something very important is going to be displayed on the screen. Yeah. Um, so in the cases where the animal wasn't primed or preconditioned to such a scenario, what would the data look like, and what would it tell you? Um, I'm going to show you, actually, of something where the monkey is not paying attention to either the, of the two stimuli, and then what happens then. I'm going to we're going to get to, get to that. Okay. Yeah. How do you condition the, the attention? So again, did you get a reward for? Yeah. So, so I didn't go through the whole training of how we get train the monkey to pay attention to the things we want them to, and so on. But they, if they do all the right things, then they get some juice at the end of. The yeah. So the yellow one is for the stimulus on the left, and the red is for the stimulus on the right. No. Oh. So the cell was always responding to the stimulus in the receptive field. So in both conditions, to say the, stimulus, the cell responds only to things in this spot, and in both conditions you have exactly the same thing in that spot, but the animal's either paying attention to it or are paying attention to something else. Say that the red spike goes higher because it's a more complex stimulus? In both cases, it's the same red stimulus. It's exactly the same stimulus. Oh, the little cone and circle here is just supposed to indicate where the animal's paying attention. Yeah, it's not the stimulus. Yeah, I should have said that. It's like the spotlight of attention here. Yeah. Uh, what happens to those signals when after they process the receptive field and you know pass on to the next stages? Do, do the differences um, in, the, in the frequency of the signals remain, or is it does it change? What happens is ev at every uh, sort of layer of processing, uh, the, the processing gets more and more complex. So imagine you're going from pixels to faces how all along the way you're getting more and more complex in how you're processing those combinations of pixels. The firing rate may, will change, but you don't know if it's going to, presumably just doesn't degrade in general, it's going to be transformed. Okay, so now, so that was um, what happens when um, you just have a single stimulus in the receptive field, and you can see that tending to create some sort of bias. What if we put stimuli in competition within the receptive field? Okay, so let's, I'll show you how, we, how, we, how one would do this experiment. So here the monkey's fixating, and um, in these two conditions, the monkey trained to basically just fixate this spot and don't pay attention to anything else. 
So now we're going to look at the response to different stimuli with the animal paying attention to something else. And what you find is, and this is going to be true at all these different areas, that for some cells, they respond best to some stimuli, and other cells respond best to other stimuli, right? So let's say, how do you process color? Well, because you have some cells that like to respond more to red, and other cells respond more to green, and others to blue, and so on. And so it's like the ratio of all this activity that's the code for color. So this particular cell gives its best response to red-oriented bars like this. And so we're in some, just um, sort of anthropomorphically I'll refer to that as a good stimulus for the cell. High firing rate. And this is the firing rate for that good stimulus. And now you find out that this cell does not respond so well to yellow stimuli of a different orientation. And this is the firing rate for the yellow stimulus. So this is a red preferring cell. Uh, the yellow, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't inhibit the cell, but the cell doesn't like yellow so much. Does that make sense? All right. This is very characteristic of what you find in the cortex. But now, here's the key thing. What happens when you put the competition with each other? Well, when you put the two stimuli there at the same time, remember, the animal's not paying attention to either of them. But look at the, 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 the combination of the two stimuli is not the sum of the response to the individual ones. It's more the average. And this is the, um, you find this over and over and over again, that as you start adding in stimuli in the receptive field, the cells start averaging all their features all, and, and gives you like the average response. Now think about, if you're, this is going on in your brain all the time, that without attention, your cells are just like averaging out. And so imagine you're looking at the scene and you're paying attention to one spot, the rest of the world doesn't go dark. It doesn't, right? It's not like it disappears. But what it is, is it's like it's become more like a statistical average. You have just a very general sense of the other stuff out there, but you're really only getting processing the stuff that you're you know, focused on attending. And, and, and there's some signal, it's just not a very good signal. And so that's the this average response here without attention. Now let's see what happens when you attend. Well. We have exactly the same two pair of stimuli, right? So this is like the scene hasn't changed. But now we've asked the monkey to pay attention to the yellow stimulus. And I mean, so the monkey doesn't know that this is a, a poor stimulus for the cell because it's going to be a good stimulus for some other cell. But for this cell, when the animal pays attention to the poor stimulus, now instead of the response to the pair being the average, it drops down and becomes similar to the response to just the yellow stimulus by itself. And so in other words, the red stimulus doesn't have much influence on the cell's response anymore. And so you can imagine that if the unattended thing is not influencing the cells very much anymore, that's maybe why you don't have any sense of it. It's gone. And so, um, so the cell's now communicating about the stimulus you're attending to, whereas for the same cell, again, this physical stimulus hasn't changed, but we've instructed the monkey now to attend to the red stimulus, now the response pops up and is now is much closer to the response you would have had had the red stimulus been there by itself. Yeah. Into account like the uh, the position of the shape within the box. Like let's say if you put the um, the red rectangle towards the corner, a corner. What? Well, how would that change the? All of these things affect the cell's response. Exactly where you position it, what's the relationship between these two stimuli. But even though all those things affect the cell's response, the, the effect of attention will always be the same, which is that the thing that you attend to, the response is driven towards the, st the response you would have had that stimulus been there by itself. And so the influence of the unattended stimulus gets filtered out. It doesn't really affect the system if you see it in that way because it, is, it actually zooms in on that color even though you have distraction, so it is being really effective. Correct. Now, notice here though that these stimuli have to be competing within the same receptive field. When I, in, the other, in the previous slide I showed you, if they're not competing with each other, so you put this other stimulus out here, then it makes a little difference which one the animal tends to, but there's still a pretty good signal for the unattended stimulus. So it's a filtering, but not a blocking at this le intermediate level of the pathway. 
And that's, and that's um, what we find as you track the system over the layer from layer to layer, is there's a progressive filtering out of the distracting information, um, but it's not blocked at, at any point along the path. Earlier you said that the system is both stimuli, the green curve, you said that it's like the average. Is, did you guys like statistically measure, like not statistically, but did you guys like measure that with like equations and stuff? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. Um, if, we, if you study one neuron and show the data, it's an anecdote. <laughs> but the plural of anecdote are not data. Uh, so that's right. So you do this on large numbers of cells, and this is what. This is what you see. And it's not, a, it's not a, exactly the average, but it's also not the sum, for, for sure. It's actually, there are, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to get to this, I'm not even sure if I have it in here, but you can uh, create quantitative models of what cells should do um, when you add stimuli in the receptive field with and without attention. And those quantitative models which are called normalization models, make very specific predictions about what individual cells should do. I don't know if I, if I have it in here, I'll highlight that for you. OK, so just to summarize that, um, you have without attention, uh, what cells do is a kind of averaging in the receptive field. That with attention, however, then the cell gives you a response as though the thing you're attending to is the only stimulus in the receptive field. So you've filtered out the, um, the distracting stimuli. So that's what the cells is communicating that message on to the rest of the brain. Uh, let me skip all that. Um, and as I said, this is going on at all levels. So um, these are supposed to be depictions of receptive fields along this object recognition pathway. So pixel size in primary visual cortex V1, little things here, then you go to V2, and they're bigger, and V4, they're bigger yet. And by the time you get to temporal areas, IT and TEO, um, you can have the whole, the whole scene could be in the receptive field. And, um, and there's filtering going on at every, every stage, so that by the time you get to the IT cortex, so now if you have a big receptive field, then everything's competing within the receptive field. Then you have largely a representation of the attended thing. So like this, this, if the student's attending to the book, you're going to have pretty much a, a representation of the book. OK, so now let's get to the, um, from a computational point of view, um, is this really the case that the computation of what an object is is improved by attention? So here's the, here's a way of thinking about this. And we're, we're going to talk now about IT cortex which has these very high level object representations, but they're not specific. So even though you haven't had a lecture on the visual system, I should tell you that in the IT cortex, the cells may respond to very complex things, but it's not like you have one cell for every object, right? So the cells are going to be picking out some complex features out of the objects, but they're not object codes, except across the whole population. An example of that in a sort of cartoonish way. So imagine you're, um, you have a, the image of a, of a car on your retina. So each of these are supposed to represent different neurons. But each neuron is going to have a different level of activity because the different neurons are going to be sensitive to different features. Some will be sensitive to the shape, to the color, to the texture, all kinds of things about uh, cars. Because the same kinds of features could be applied to any object, right? The color, the shape, the orientation, and so on. And so this, and, and the fact that this is a car is essentially coded by this pattern of activity. All right. Now imagine, you know, now you have a tomato. And you have the same cells. You don't get another group of cells. You have the same cells. But their activity is all going to be different because they have, because you now have different combinations of features. So the colors change and shape and so on and so on. OK. And that's the code for tomato. The problem comes when you put two stimuli. Sorry, and the problem comes when you put two stimuli in the receptive field. And now, you only have one population of cells. What does that population do with the two stimuli? Well, it tries to represent the features in both. And, and as a result, you're going to get more of this averaging. And so the code isn't very good for either the tomato or the car. Um, 
But the idea is that if you, um, sorry, but the idea is that if you um, attend, let's say, to the car, that you should get back the code for the car. And if you attend it for the tomato, well, I don't have that here. But in any case, you get back the code for the tomato. OK. So how did, how did it actually test this? So in this experiment that we did in collaboration with Tommy Poggio here in CBMM, um, we recorded neurons in the IT cortex of a monkey who was looking at the complex objects on the screen. And so we're recording these. These are supposed to represent the action potentials of different neurons. So we can record these firing rates of different cells. And then we send them through a software pattern classifier that is trying to learn the association between the firing rates of the different cells and what the monkey is looking at. So you learn, you learn the, um, the code. And different objects, different firing rates. And, um, and then once you've learned a code, you can start making predictions. So if you say, given that I have this level of firing rate, the monkey must be looking at a kiwi. And you can say, oh, is that correct or not correct? And that's it, or code, yeah. Um, after you obtain the specific code for specific objects, is it possible to infuse like, that code, like activate the, activate the same cells in the brain of the monkey and then in the same see manner the and then you see the object? Is that possible? Great experiment. You should come here and do that experiment. Very difficult experiment to do because um, the population that represents these things is very big. And then you have to say, so how can you change the population, you know, the activity of all these cells differently? But there are people who are thinking about how to do that exact experiment. But in principle, it should be true. Now, if you have a cluster, let's say you have a cluster with, which are all, where the cells are all firing at a high rate for faces, then people have tried to stimulate the whole cluster and asked, does your perception become more biased toward seeing a face? And if you give people like an ambiguous stimulus, they might actually see a face then. Yeah. Is there any way to do this into a neural network or into a computer of some sort? This is all done. I'm saying, no, any way to encode, like, OK, this means a key neural So can So, so the pattern classifier is not a neural network. It's not, a, it's not supposed to represent. The pattern classifier is not built uh, to, to uh, mimic the uh, cortex. However, other people are, in fact, trying to build models of the cortex that do, in fact, code in the way that they think the cortex might code. And maybe, you, maybe you'll hear, are they going to hear from Tommy or any of the, no, OK. Anyhow, there are people here that are trying to build models of, of this, um, the coding of objects by the neural population. Absolutely. Yeah. Is the firing consistent even when like, the picture changes, like its various images of kiwis? or um... Is it only for one picture of a kiwi? Ah, so it depends on what the code is. So for some cells, let's say they're only coding color. Well, then they're going to may respond the same to a kiwi, and I don't know something else that's green, a Martian. Um, so, um, so it depends on the on the particular cells, uh, how they generalize across objects. But it, the idea is that you put all this information together, and the intersection of all these different Feature codes specifies this particular kiwi, that you can code the actual kiwi, not just the family of kiwis. Yeah. So I'm looking at like neuron one, two, three, and ten. So when you record, how can you be sure you're recording all of the neurons that are processing? You can be sure that you are not, uh, <laughs> uh, because there are hundreds of millions of cells in the system, and usually. Um, neurophysiologists are recording from anywhere from one to at most a few hundred. And so we are only getting a sampling of the population, which is an issue. Yeah. How do you know where specific uh, Where to put, yeah, where to record. So um, it's another really a big and important question. Um, to a certain extent, if you just record from sort of the generic cortex, uh, the is lots of different objects, um, that you're going to get some kind of sampling of the overall population state. Um, and, and usually you'll get some, some activity. However, we know now that the cortex is a more modular organization, so that the, there are neurons that are more involved in processing faces, tend to be localized in different part, 
patches in the cortex. There are more, the other neurons more involved in processing body parts um, and maybe more involved in social interactions and so on. And so what um, some people have, what, what, and so one, what, one way that people identify those and then target them for recording is using fMRI to, and so they put animals or people in a scanner and then they, they look at the activity across the whole system and they see like, there's, oh, here's this zone that's really active whenever the person looks at a the face. They say, okay, so that's the area that we should target for face. Having the computer learn how to the electrode has to stay in the same place in the same animal. Correct, but, you, but normally these experiments are done all within a day. So every day you would sample another group of neurons, but it's the same neuron for that day's testing. Yeah. So I have some questions. So is there just one cluster of neurons that you guys are observing, or are there various ones throughout the brain? So what, yeah, also, excellent question. Uh, and this is evolving. So um, in the early days of, of recordings in this field, um, everybody studied one neuron at a time. They study one neuron a day or one neuron a week. Um, and, and then they would try to generalize from a very small number. And now people go, oh, no, so now we can have record from, we have the technology and the computers and so on to record from more neurons. But now they're saying, oh, this, now we don't want to record just from, from new neurons in IT cortex. We also want to look at this part and this part and this part and see how they're all going at the same time. And the technology is, is improving rapidly enough that, peop that people have more and more ability to record across multiple areas at the same time. In fact, the, the, um, the Allen Institute and... Um, and the Wellcome Trust and a, a number of these big foundations are funding initiatives to record from like the, all, virtually the entire brain uh, in, in mice at this point, uh, but trying to, to build huge databases across labs all over the world of what's going on over the whole brain. Because otherwise you get just a narrow picture of what's going on. Rapidly um, changing and the technology is trying to keep up with it. I had is so when you look at one image, like a certain, you said that a one neuron is going to be responsible for like encoding for like the color, for example. If I look at another, at another image, would it be that same neuron, the one that's responsible for encoding for the color, or would it be, is there a possibility that another neuron has that responsibility? Both. It could be one or the other. Um, but if a neuron is, is and, and there's not going to be just one neuron coding color, it's, right, it's going to be contributing one little piece to the whole color code, right? Um, but it could be there's a neuron that's only involved in encoding the color of fruit and another neuron that's involved only in the coding of the color of sofas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, the idea is, so you, once you have a good classifier, you can um, use it to decode what the animal is looking at. So in this experiment, um, we recorded from a bunch of neurons, um, and the, um, the basic uh, task design was the animal would be fixating a spot, say here, and then we could place anywhere from one to three stimuli inside the very large receptive field of the IT neuron. Um, so, uh, and they were positioned like so. Uh, and after the stimuli appeared, a little dim bar would, would appear, and the monkey would be trained to know that it should pay attention to whatever stimulus the dim bar is pointing to, like the sofa in this trial. And because at some random point in time, that sofa is going to change color very slightly, and at that point, it should make an eye movement to it. And if, let's say, the car changed color slightly, it should ignore that. It should really focus, let's say, on the sofa in this case. And then the next trial, the dim bar will point to some other object. And the locations are all being randomized. So the, 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 uh, the dim bar where it points to and the objects are all being randomized across trials. Okay? And then, so then we could see, like, what's the effect of attention on the response to a, an object or multiple objects? And we're going to use this decoding approach. And the, the different stimuli that were used were cars, uh, vet vegetables, faces, and furniture, which, as you know, are the four major categories of objects in the known universe. And we will generalize to all objects from those. Yes? Angles? 
where can you explain that a little bit? Say so again? On some angles coming out from the fixating point that said like 60 degrees and... Well, in this experiment, they were just at fixed angles, though. But but the, but there were three fixed locations. It's just that the objects at those locations could be randomized, and then it would point randomly to one of them. So, Do you have any like relevant information of how maybe the, the he's moving? He's trying to look at the different objects, or the angle wouldn't have any other information about what angles. So the angles are just simply part of the test. It's not like you're not measuring anything about it, like. No, no, that's right. That's just our design. The monkey, that's it's irrelevant for the monkey. Yeah. Um, so on the first days of the workshop, we were talking to Idan Plank, and in his experimental design to understand certain like physical aspects of the brain, he would make sure to remove like all other stimuli by trying to recreate a, a stimuli it was very similar except for specifically the thing that you're interested in knowing about. Like, I'm guessing here you want to know how the attention changes. So do you create similar situations which you then subtract from the you get to make? Exactly. Okay. So what we're going to look at is the same physical stimulus. So the physical stimulus is held constant, but we're going to change which, where the animal is paying attention. That's the only thing that changes. That's that's the that's the extracted variable is which one the animal's attending to. Okay. Okay. So, um, and then we're going to do that decoding on the firing rates of the cells in a window of time, and we're going to move that window across the the time of the trial, so you can look at the coding performance every moment in time. And the coding performance is going to be measured by area under an ROC curve. It doesn't matter. You don't need to know what that means, really. It's just that 1 would be perfect classification of the object, and 0.5 is chance. It's just a measure. OK. So what happens when you have just a single object in the receptive field and do this decoding analysis? So if the stimulus comes on at time 0. Before time 0, um, the decoder is at chance. That's good. Um, so there's, there's nothing to decode. It doesn't know anything. But after the stimulus appears, the, the performance of the coder jumps up. And um, on this, in this, for this population, the decoding performance was uh, peaked at about 85%, which is not so bad, considering that we're only recording from a few neurons. Um, and um, in this one, the, although the monkey wasn't um, um, cued to pay attention to it in particular, Given that the monkey's fixating in a blank screen, there's only one object, the monkey's presumably paying attention to this. Okay. That's, that's not the, the key thing. The key thing is what happens now. Now we have three objects appear on the screen, and we're going to separate out the decoding of the object that the animal's been paying attention to, let's say it was the face, um, versus the decoding of the unattended objects. And so this is now the green and the red lines. So the red line is the decoding of the attended object, and the green is the unattended objects. And the cue that tells the animal where to attend is, um, comes on here at 500 milliseconds. So for this period of time, um, the monkey doesn't know what to pay attention to. And so the decoding performance is only a, a somewhat better than chance. Okay, But once the animal knows, let's say, to attend to this object, look, the decoder performance starts going up. Whereas the decoding of the unattended objects starts going down. Now, the decoder performance doesn't, never gets as good as you would have had had that object been on the screen by itself. And that kind of makes sense, because um, your, your ability to filter out distractors is never as good as the ability to just physically remove them. Right? So if you only have one thing to pay attention to, you're always going to be better than if you're paying, trying to pay attention to one thing in the presence of distractors. But it's improved. And that was the, that was the prediction, that the decoding would improve um, with attention. And if you look at the firing cells, um, that um, is consistent with this explanation. So it's just similar to that example I showed you from area V4, the intermediate area before. So if we look at the response to the, for each cell that's best object, that's the red line here. That's the firing rate. That's good. Um, if 
look at the, uh, the worst object for each cell presented in isolation. That's down here, so there's the poor response. And then if you look for the response to the um, attended stimuli, that's the, the two intermediate colors here in the middle. And for when the animal pays attention to the best object, and here the cue comes on at 500 milliseconds, the response jumps up. But if you cue the animal to attend to the worst object, the response gets suppressed. Yeah. The baseline is just the blank screen. Uh, and fixating. That's what ha that's it in this period right here. That's why there's a chance that that's why there's that's why that's why it's it's like the other graph before. Uh, did I use a different time base on the other one? I don't know. Starts at, at like uh, at well, around 0.5. Well, here we're, they're, they're always starting at zero, but this is time before zero. Oh, so the, so the area under the ROC curve uh, is 0.5 because that's chance. But the firing rates are, um, oops, oh, sorry. The firing rates are going to be in, um, actually what we did was we looked at change in firing rate from the mean. So zero means mean firing rate on the blank screen. So that's, that's where they started. And then this is change up from the mean, and this is change down from the mean. What's yeah. the high theory for best parts? We typically just rank, just rank ordering. So in other words, for each cell, the whole bunch of objects were presented. And you say, OK, which object gave the best response, which was the worst response? That's all. OK. So, oh. Uh, so does this class go to 11.30 or 11.45? OK, good. So we have a few more minutes left. Um, I'm trying to think what's would be, going to be the, um, so we only have a few minutes left. Um, let's, let's, let's skip ahead and talk about the, um, the uh, top-down control of attention. So this is so when I tell you, pay attention to my left hand, um, what are the areas in that? And um, let's see. What a second. So as I mentioned earlier, I showed you this. This is the diagram of the ventral stream, the object recognition system. This is the, the green areas shown in green are other cortical areas that are more involved in the level of spatial attention, attending to things in space at different locations in space. A whole bunch of areas there, including up in prefrontal cortex, front part of the brain, which includes the frontal eye fields, which is involved not only in controlling where the eyes are, are going to move, but also where you're going to pay attention to. And the parietal cortex shown here is also known to play an important role in selecting what, where you're going to pay attention. And uh, there's lots of evidence for the role of the parietal and the prefrontal cortex in, um, in this control of where you're going to pay attention. But one of them comes from brain damage. Although the brain damage stories in humans is a little complicated. So um, if you ask where can people suffer brain damage that would Im impact their ability to pay attention, generally there's the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex. Uh, and they can cause something, um, damage stories can cause something that's, that's known as neglect. And so what's neglect? Um, first of all, this is a peculiarity of humans that you, in humans, uh, almost always um, see neglect from damage in the right hemisphere, but not the left. In animals, it's both hemispheres, but in humans, it's on the right. And we'll get to, we can get to have some discussion about that. Um, and, but it's in the prefrontal or the parietal cortex can give you the, so something called neglect. And what it is is then people ignore everything in that side of space or it could be on that side of their body, uh, opposite to the lesion. Um, or in some particular lesion, so it's on a particular side of the object rather than space. We'll get to that. But it's not blindness. So by attracting the person's attention, you can get them to, to report on anything. It's just that um, they tend to ignore it. Their, their, their attention is biased away from that side of, of space or the body. Um, and in a particular case where they only show this condition, if there's some competition from objects in the good part of space, the unaffected part, and then if they only show the impairment then, 
referred to as extinction. So there's neglect and, and extinction. And let's see like, what some examples of this would be in an actual person that's had brain damage. So these are examples of patients copying models provided by the clinician um, that, have had, that have unilateral neglect. So here's the model of the clock, and this is the patient's copy. Now what you see is that they, don't, they didn't drop out the whole clock on one side. They're not blind, uh, but they emphasize the side of the clock in one half of space. Here's a, their, their attempt to copy the house. So again, they're emphasizing one side, uh, even though the other side is not really completely gone. So this would be, this would be um, the kind of thing you'd see in someone with neglect. Um, these are paintings that were uh, painted by an artist uh, he, who, who painted his own um, self-image. And the artist had a stroke that gave him neglect from a right-sided lesion, and over time he was gradually recovering from his stroke. And what you see is immediately after the stroke, he almost leaves out one side of his face. But that as he's recovering, you can see how he has kind of de-emphasizing one side. He's really paying more attention to the other side, and it, it gradually, and then it, and gradually it recovers. So again, it's not, it's not you know either or, but it's a shifting bias away from one side of space in this case, and it recovers over time. And an example of extinction um, is shown here, where you get this from. Um, wiggling your fingers. Um, so um, a clinician is testing his patient, and they say, well, just point to where my fingers. And um, if they, um, they wiggle, they put their two hands up. They wiggle their fingers on one side, the patient points to it. They wiggle their fingers on the other side, the patient can point to that. So you say, oh, the patient's fine. But if they wiggle their fingers on both sides, they'll always point to the one on the left side. Um, sorry, on, the, on their right side, rather. So. Um, um, so this is the extinction condition because you have competition between the stimuli on the two sides. Does that make sense? All right. I'll give you an example of what neglect looks like in a um, little video. Patient testing. So he's, the patient's there, the clinician's testing the two sides. There you go. Good. That was a quick one. So on one side, he orients right away. But on the first side, nothing. Here's an example of extinction. Look at me. Right hand. Good. Which one? Left hand. Good. Look at me. Good. Right at me. Ready? Which hand? Left hand. Good. Which hand? Right. For you. Look at me again. Which hand? Right. Great. Again? Right. Again? Right. Good. Okay, so this patient actually in the extinction phase, this may be later following the stroke, it's often the case. You start off with neglect. You don't need any competition. You just ignore one side of space. As you get better and better and better, it may shift to extinction. So you only, only ignore a side if there's strong competition on the other side. And this is how the clinician can do it. And you don't need, uh, for this, this kind of simple demonstration, you don't, you don't need very sophisticated equipment. You only need wiggling fingers. Now, you may think, oh, this is pretty straightforward, right? The right side of the brain processes the left space, and, you know, it's, uh, that's pretty straightforward. However, clever cl clinicians can reveal that it's even more, it's much more complex than that. And this is an example from the um, neuropsychologist uh, Biziak, an Italian uh, neuropsychologist, who um, tested the, quote, mind's eye of his patients. So what he did was he took a patient with neglect, and he asked him to imagine that he was standing at one side of a famous piazza in this town. He says, OK, so imagine you're standing at the end of the piazza. Look across the piazza and tell me what you see. And what the patient reports is one side of the piazza. Um, so he has, so he clearly, so he's like a neglect of that side of his mind's eye. And then he says, okay, now turn around, walk 
the other side of the piazza, turn around, and now from the other side of the piazza, tell me what you see. And now they, they describe the half of the piazza that they had just ignored. So it's even their movements in space in their internal mind's eye determining what information they processed. So it's not the retina, right? It's something much more cognitive than that. Yeah. Also, work um, with patients, for example, who suffer trauma from a car accident, who um, like possibly you know how they test for paralysis after a car accident, where they tap um, both feet. Is it possible for them to also like feel a higher sensation on one side of the brain versus the other at the same? Well, so in the car accident, so the, 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 the clever clinicians got to separate out real sensory problems from attentional problems, and sometimes. People have damage on one side of their brain. It's not that they can't attend to things. They've actually lost some of the sensation on that part of the body, particularly from uh, if they have a parietal lesion. Depending on where it is in parietal cortex, it may affect their sense of their skin sense. So they just they're actually um, it's almost like they're anesthetized or, uh, on one side. But it could be, you know that it's affecting more of the attention, and you got to tease those apart. You know, by if you you know you stimulate the, the subject's skin, they don't say, "Oh, I can't really feel that." And you say, "But really, you know, pay, try to pay attention." They go, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I feel. It. So then it's probably attentional. If they just can't report it, then it's probably sensory. Yeah. Uh, I know there have been some cases where you do lose function in one part of your brain due to a lesion, but another area will kind of like fill in the gap. Um, is that the case in regard to the artist? Did when he had the stroke, did uh, you know a couple set of neurons say, "All right, well, I can pick up the slack and kind of fire the same way that you guys did," or maybe it's a sound version because you did say that some neurons kind of have like, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, one neuron is only focusing on this specific feature of that window, or they only notice that abstract idea of this window, kind of like how we take knowledge in, you know, like we have a prototype, so or or like, you know, like a, a absolutely uh, evidence-based approach, you know, like approach. I, I'll I'll try and pick up your slack, kind of like, oh, I'll take this idea from you or that firing signal from you, and kind of like just fill in the gap. But I, it doesn't seem like it happens to everyone, because with his case, right, he was be, he was able to kind of like gain it back. But for some people, they kind of just don't gain that back. Like yeah, deep. absolutely. So I mean, you're putting your finger on all the important questions in the field that people are studying right now. So. When people recover from stroke, what actually is going on? Is it some parts taking over the function, or are people learning to do the same thing in a different way? Um, give me an example. I always like to use the example of the physical body because I think that you know the brain's just another physical part of the body. So let's say that um, you lose a finger and you're a pianist, and I don't know the functions of your finger. All I know, all I can do as a clinician is study how you play the piano. So after your, uh, you lose your finger, I ask the piano piece and I notice that there's some notes that are constantly left out. So I say, oh, look, there's the legion effect. But over time, as you're practicing more and more and more, eh, those notes end up getting played. So what happened? You didn't grow a finger. The other finger didn't take on the, I mean, is it say they took on the functions of that finger? Or you learn to use your hand in a different way, in a way to compensate for the loss of that finger. So it's, it's a little hard to say sometimes is what's taking over a function, what's a kind of compensation, what is it using your other parts of the brain in a way that they you know, weren't originally trained for. It's all mixed in together. Yeah. A patient changed sight and he claimed that he can see the part they left out from the piazza. Um, it, was there like any kind of analysis of, of, of the precision, the details that the patient is giving for the description uh, of that side when he, when he gets it back? And maybe he can when he changes side, but it's not, it wouldn't be as, like, it wouldn't be as descriptive of, of, or as precise. Um, he, he might have had some be ability to describe it, but just impaired. Yeah. Some vague of idea of what of what he's um, of, of what he of, of what he would have saw or what he was supposed to see, but it's still very impaired by the. Yeah, um, depending on the, all these things are again are spectrums, right? So it could be that someone has a total lack of awareness of something on one side, or someone else may have a partial awareness, and you'll see everything in between. The other thing is about these patients, and, and, and um, it's a little bit related to 
what you're asking, and I usually get this asked this anyhow, is, um, is whether people have an awareness of this. Um, so are people aware of their impairment? And so if I lesion your retina, so I put a hole in your retina, you're going to see a hole in space. You're very aware of it, right? There's no subtlety there, right? But what if I put a hole in your parietal cortex? Are you aware of that? And the answer is, usually, the further you go from the primary sensory surfaces, deeper and deeper and deeper into the brain, the less and less awareness you have of your own impairment. So people may even deny, so some people, I'm, I'm all talking about visual neglect here, people neglect the side of their body. Sometimes, so they have the right, so they, so they neglect, say, their, their, their left side. And some people uh, just tend to not use one side very much. Other people think that their hand belongs to another person. Um, and so they, they, don't, they don't process that they have neglect. They don't understand, they've lost the ability to understand what they can't do anymore. Uh, and what people do often, uh, patients, is when they've, um, when they have the high level lesions, they just make stuff up. So they make up a story for why they can't do some things anymore. So like, you don't, you don't use your left hand when you're driving. Oh, my left hand was tired. Uh, oh, my left hand had a cramp today or something. They, they just make up stories to try to make their world kind of consistent. They, they do what we call confabulate. And actually, and once you've seen patients confabulating about trying to get over their own impairments, they make up these stories that they actually believe, you start to see that maybe normal people confabulate a lot too. Uh, they just make up stories that make sense to them and then believe them. Yeah. The, them filling in that gap, but like literally through hallucinations, like visual hallucinations to fill that gap. Do you know about that pathway or circuit? How would that work in terms of the, what we saw, the visual circuit, but it's being like reversed, I suppose? Like, is the hallucination is going to fill that gap? Um, actual hallucinations are not that common. Um, so they're more, um, I'd say they're just more cognitive than that. They have strange beliefs but they actually see something, say, that's not there is very unusual. It's from like all other sides, like he has a book on oh. He talks a lot about like people that have blindness and then they tend to compensate with that blindness with hallucinations. Like the brain will give them visual imagery. I mean, it's, yeah. it's weird, but, but it makes me Yeah, wonder. you see a lot of things across patients. I'd say I have to, I, Oliver Sacks is one neurologist I should maybe not speak badly of him because he's dead now, but um, I would take a lot of what he says with a grain of salt. Yeah. Does that kind of delve into like the biological side of metacognition? Say like, again? Does that kind of delve into like the biological side of metacognition? Kind of like you knowing you kind of have like these ideas of what you, you know, what you have. So like imagine you did like, you know, an fMRI study on somebody that did actually that confabulation, right? Uh, you kind of now have a sense of like where to look when you kind of like want to search for information in your brain. Like I know that my hand is here, and you kind of like like I have a reason to know that it's here because I can feel it, I can touch it. But now you're like, oh, you know, you kind of like make a, mm -hmm. you kind of mm -hmm. move to your prefrontal cortex or something like that. It kind of like moves forward because you can't. A search for that yeah. area. You're saying, is it possible to, to make this a, a scientific inquiry to try to understand um, these stories that people have and beliefs that they have, and what are the what are the basis of these beliefs and stories and so on? Yeah, that's a, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to study. I'd say it's, there's not people working a lot on that. There's a, a very limited amount, but that maybe you will do that. The question is around, I guess, understanding because it was like a physiological connection between proprioception and stereoception. You talk about like uh, the visual cue you get, which like directs the touch you sitting down, and then proprioception meaning like you know your body is in space, and then stereoception meaning like space around you, how you perceive it or feel it or sense it. Is, are all those things yeah. discriminated or are they connected? They're all related to each other. Different brain lesions can affect them differently. And so, and even this is issue of neglect. Um, you know, I glossed over this issue about um, the side. I think I may have mentioned that some people have problems with, you know, the particular side of an object. So, um, and I don't, I don't, I didn't include this video, but um, 
the, I have another video with that same patient that showed neglect in one side of space. The clinician who's doing the thing with the fingers rotates his body. Okay, so now the two fingers are, are both in, equally in, in the middle of space. And it turns out that they now the patient neglects the finger on the left side of the person's, of, of the clinician's body. And so it turns out that it was more of an object centered um, neglect that he had, where some people it's actually locked to, to external space. And, uh, and then you can see variations or of these things and it depends on exactly where the lesion is so yes those are those you can differentiate to a certain extent and you can see it in the, in the lesion cases yeah um, those theories of principles that we dis uh, discuss right now are very visual like they relate to the visual field are there similarities in like um, Audio, audio data that we receive or other yeah. types of information? So the visual system works in a very similar way to all the other sensory systems. But the reason that we focused on vision in this lecture is because that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you your opinion on, like, you mentioned the single neurons in clusters and then the compensation. And I know there's some of the sensory map that has, like, right, like, one yep. finger, an area for another finger. When you mentioned that you cut another finger and then you have to compensate so that area, like, enlarges of the other fingers. So in terms of, like, neurons and clusters, like, what is your opinion on that compensation and that mechanism? That, that's a whole big field, actually. And, um, and, and actually, what... Um, there's far more known about plasticity in that system for the skin sense than there is in the visual system. Um, that um, because your, your body itself is changing over your lifetime much more than your your retina doesn't change very much over your lifetime. But your body, think about it. You go from a tiny kid to a big adult. There's a huge change in the body surface, right? Uh, also, you use different parts of your body very differently than someone else does and over the lifetime. And your body representations in your tactile sense cortex are changing a lot. And so, yeah, it's, but that's a whole other lecture about the changes in the tactile system. Okay, I think you're going to need lunch, but we, I, think, I think we covered a lot. We covered um, consciousness, <laughs> object recognition, attention, top-down control, and so I hope you at least heard enough that you might want to follow up on some of these issues. It's really been a pleasure.